the history of management starting with the classical perspective from Unit 1, Chapter 2, Lesson 1, Part 4. At this point, I often have people wondering why they even need to consider the history of management theory. But I want to encourage you that this can be really helpful for your understanding of the world that you're operating and working in today. And so I believe that it will give you greater context and help develop your conceptual skills and perhaps even help you identify the trends that are going to take place throughout the course of your career. So as we look at the different theories, you'll see that there are a variety of influences ranging from social forces to political forces and also economic drivers that dictated the changes that we observe in management theory. Here you can see a visual representation of the evolution of management theory. In this lecture, we're going to look at the classical perspective. In the next lecture, we're going to look at the humanistic and management sciences perspectives. And then lastly, we're going to look at recent trends, which is quite a grouping going all the way from systems thinking to open collaborative innovation, as you'll see that the trend and pace of change has really picked up. Although we see the earliest references to management occurring around about the time that the pyramids were built, the formal study of management only really gained traction in the 19th and earliest 20th centuries. And this was really because there was a rise of the factory system. So there was mass production, there were steam engines, the rise of electricity, and suddenly it wasn't small organizations, but rather larger ones with more employees. And there were new questions with regards to how to structure the organization, who to provide training to and how much training to provide and how important it was for employees to be satisfied at work. But these large complex organizations specifically really brought into focus the need for new approaches to coordinate and control the employees of the firm. There are three subfields under the classical perspective that we are going to discuss. Scientific management, bureaucratic organizations and administrative principles. I recommend that you pay attention to what each of these have in common and also how they differ as each step forward in management study has brought further insights. Frederick Winslow Taylor is known as the father of scientific management, and this largely came from his perspective on the employees of the organization. He believed that workers were much like the tools in the factory, and if you studied them scientifically and looked at every action and activity that they took, that you could then design and repurpose their actions much like you would retool a machine for a different job. So really, the focus of scientific management was to improve efficiency and productivity through being very systematic and scientific in the approach to designing jobs. The idea that Taylor brought forward was that management decisions should be based not on rules of thumb or past ideas, or this is the way we've always done things, but rather on a very precise understanding that was developed through rigorous scientific study. Taylor was not alone in advocating scientific management and his contemporaries were Henry Gantt that developed the Gantt chart, uh, often used in project management till today, and it measures and plans work. So essentially, it's a bar graph that measures planned and completed work along each stage of production by the time that has passed. And this has been very influential specifically in project management. Other contemporaries were the Gilbreths, Frank and Lillian, and they pioneered time and motion studies. So Frank Gilbreth actually did really interesting work with bricklayers, studying each action and activity that was involved in laying bricks, and made some interesting recommendations to increase the productivity of bricklayers. He also made significant contributions to the medical field, improving uh, surgeries and indeed the time that it took to conduct a surgery by doing time and motion studies. His wife was more interested in the human aspect. So you'll see that she was ahead of her time in observing the importance of employees in the organization. The general approach of scientific management can be summed up as looking for a standard method for each job in the organization to be performed. So you have to select workers that have the right abilities, you have to train them in a very standard procedure, and then of course provide a wage incentive for meeting this increased output goal. 
Now, we can't deny that this contributed something valuable to the field of management, notably in the form of uh, how important compensation for performance is. It also introduced the careful study of tasks and jobs, and it really started emphasizing the importance of selecting the right person and training them appropriately. Unfortunately, it was not a holistic answer to all of our questions. And some of the criticisms that can be leveled at scientific management is that it did not consider the social context of work, the higher order needs of employees, and it really didn't acknowledge them as individuals or take their suggestions into consideration. Hot on the heels of scientific management came the introduction by Max Weber of the concept of a bureaucratic organization. He introduced the idea that instead of businesses being run as a family business where individuals were loyal to one manager but not the organization as a whole, companies should be run in a professional, impersonal, rational way. So he really advocated the development of rules, records and procedures so that it would be based on someone deserving the job or knowing what the criteria were to be promoted or what the reasons were for being dismissed. So really the idea here was that managers would have a certain power vested in their position as managers instead of just relying on the personality or their personal power to delegate. It brought really important productivity gains that are still valuable today. But unfortunately, when you hear the word bureaucracy today, it does have a negative tone. We can all remember standing in a queue for too long or having to comply with unnecessary rules. Before Max Weber's term bureaucracy took on a negative term, he made a very positive contribution. And he envisioned the ideal bureaucracy as having certain criteria. There would be division of labor. So there would be clear definitions outlining who's responsible and who is the authority to make certain decisions. Positions in the firm, according to him, should be organized in terms of a hierarchy of authority. So everyone should know who they're reporting to and who is accountable for which decisions. Managers, this was very important, were also subject to rules and procedures. And this was to ensure that there was reliable, predictable behavior. So to root out things like favoritism, unfair promotion or dismissal. An interesting and novel contribution that he made was that management in this new professional firm should be separate from the ownership of the organization. So he saw this as a criteria of professionalizing the workplace. He also saw uh, or said that administrative acts and decisions should be recorded in writing. So you see here the first uh, written form of what you would probably know in the workplace as having a paper trail to cover yourself. And then he also said that a firm should be a meritocracy. Person personnel should be selected and promoted based on the qualifications and technical knowledge that they had. The last contributor to the classical perspective was Henry Fail, a French mining engineer who contributed the idea of administrative principles. At the end of his career, he started writing up the experience that he had gained in managing employees. And his most significant work contributed 14 general principles of management. We're going to highlight four that are still in use today. Firstly, unity of command, outlining that each employee should receive orders from only one superior. You can see that this is quite important in terms of eliminating confusion with employees. Then division of work. So he said that certain work, such as managerial or technical work, can benefit from specialization. And this should be taken into consideration so that staff could hone those skills. The next point was unity of direction. He advocated that certain activities in an organization should be grouped together so that the manager again could be an expert on managing those activities. And we still see this today. Uh, organizations have a marketing department and a finance department where individuals with similar skill sets are grouped together. And lastly, the scalar chain. So in organizing and structuring the organization, he advocated that the chain of authority should extend from the top to the bottom of the organization and should include every employee. So we see this in organizational hierarchies, uh, everywhere from the CEO to the street sweeper. Another important contribution he made was he advocated five basic functions or elements of management, planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating, and controlling. 
I hope that already sounds a little familiar because you will note it's what we base this course on. The only thing that's changed is how we've grouped them. Planning and organizing have remained the same. Commanding and coordinating have been grouped together under leadership. And lastly, controlling. So you can see that he's really made a very significant contribution to the study of management. Fayel also made an important contribution in identifying five functions of management, planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating, and controlling. I hope that you recognize that we've already spoken of these before. Planning, organizing, they've stayed exactly the same. But as management theory has evolved, commanding and coordinating have been joined together under the banner of leadership. And so we end up with our acronym, planning, organizing, leading, controlling, or PALC for short.